I beseech thee therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just bless you this morning. We thank you for your presence in our midst and all that has gone forth. And we pray now that as we enter into the study of your word, that you would open our hearts to receive your truth, our minds for understanding that we may be transformed in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good to see you, Tahira. Amen. Everybody that's here. Okay, so last week we began uh, talking about the process of transformation. And because humans do not go through a physical or biological metamorphosis, we go through a spiritual and uh, psychological, I would dare to say even emotional, uh, metamorphosis. And so we looked at the caterpillar who goes through changes to become a butterfly. And the Bible tells us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And we know from experience and even in our own uh, situations that change does not come easy for most human beings. We don't like change. It's, it's for some reason, I think it, it brings an uh, uh, uncertainty and insecurity. Even though we may be in a bad situation, we'd rather be there than to, to chance going into something else and it not working. I know when I was in the um, work um, arena that there were so many people who were disgruntled about their jobs, but when they were challenged to find another job, they would say, well, I know what this is. I don't know what, what will happen. What if I get a better job and then it's not stable? Not realizing the job they were in were not, was not stable. Just because you've been there for a long time, it, there is no assurance what the next day will bring. Amen? And so um, change is biblical. And we, we looked at John 3 and 6. And um, we also looked at Matthew 9 and 16, John 3 and 6, where Jesus tells Nicodemus, except that a man be changed, except that a man be changed by the Holy Spirit, except that a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. A change must take place in us in order for us to benefit from being disciples, being members of the body of Christ, being kingdom people. And um, in Matthew 9 and 16, it's, he talks about the uh, old wine and the new wine, that, uh, that old skins cannot contain new uh, wine. And our mindsets can be old skins. Amen. Old skins cannot contain new wine because the new wine is going to expand the wine skin. And an old skin has gone as far as it can go. So if you put new wine in an old skin, it's going to blow. Amen? It's going to blow up. It's going to burst. It's going to expand. And so we have biblical principles for the need for change, 
for transformation in our lives, in, especially in the spiritual realm. Uh, we get stuck on what we learned in Sunday school. We get stuck on uh, false teachings, uh, maybe in the church we grew up in, or we may have heard something or misinterpreted the scripture, and when truth comes, we resist it. We say, I know, but. We don't want to, number one, admit that we were not always right, and we don't want to accept what is new because with the light of the word, there comes a realization for change. And in many circumstances, when we are challenged to change, we will avoid it. Amen? Amen? When those of us who, who, were, who partied before we came on the Lord's side, we, we would go into dark places. Whether it, it, it was a, a cabaret or whatever, you know, par, a house party with the blue light. We liked partying in darkness. And first of all, light reveals. Amen. So when the lights come on, you don't look as pretty as you did when the lights were dim. Amen. When the lights come on, the house doesn't look as clean as it did when the lights were off. And, and that's how we can be in our minds. Dark, we, you know, we will prefer the darkness of ignorance and error than to, to, to receive the light of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which is transforming. Because when we're challenged to change, that means that everything must change. Everything must change. We learned last week that everything that is living has to change in order to thrive, in order to survive. The virus is changing because God designed that everything that is living changes to survive. And so now we have all of the variances because the virus says, oh, no, they're fighting us. They're trying to get rid of us. We, we've got to get stronger. We have to work around this vaccine. We have to work around the sanitizer. We have to work around all of these things, so let's morph, let's change in order for us to survive. Even as human beings, when we look through centuries and look through time, we have adapted as a race, the human race. Changes in our complexions, changes in our hair, hair uh, consistencies and textures because of the various geographical locations that as the world became populated and moved from the Middle East, from Africa into Asia and Europe and, uh, and expanded over the globe, the, the distance from the sun and the different vegetation and all of these things caused us to adapt. Technology is causing us to adapt. Our fingers, you notice people, the thumbs are getting thicker and why wow, we're, we're adapting to the lifestyle, to the technology, to what we do constantly. And nature changes from season to season. So the caterpillar goes through metamorphosis to preserve the species because the butterfly has the distinct purpose of multiplying and reproducing the species. Now, the purpose we learned of the caterpillar is to feed itself, to prepare for change to feed itself, to prepare for change. Why? Because the caterpillar, some breeds don't feed at all as butterflies. Once that caterpillar becomes a butterfly, 
depending on the species or the var variety of the species, it may not eat ever again. And then you, 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 it, if it eats, it's going to eat something different. But we'll, we'll talk, talk about that in a second. Change in our lives, when we talk about processing, the process of transformation, the process of change. Because, you know, we hear people talk about uh, changing. We hear people talking about processing. But, but, but how do I know I'm processing? How, how do I know I'm changing? Because, see, some changes take place in our life that others see but we don't see. Unless something happens and we realize that we responded differently than we have in the past. But when we look at the caterpillar and its process of changing into a butterfly, we find out that the change starts from within. The change that, see, it, it, we, taking off our makeup and putting on holy looking clothes and all means nothing if we're not changed on the inside. And Ella Vanessa, that's why I, I don't mess with people about what they wear as long as they're not totally naked. Amen, in the house of God. Because when God begins to change them, when they are being transformed by his Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord will open their eyes to what they need to put on. Amen. Throwing lap cloths on folks and all that was good in its time, but it ran more people away than it brought to Christ. Change begins from within. Us Doing certain practices because we know we should does not mean we've been transformed. It does not mean that we have been changed. The caterpillar changes in the cocoon from within. It digests from the inside out. A new body emerges, which was constructed by, by that which was hidden within the caterpillar. The, the, in, in the cocoon, the caterpillar begins to die to its old self. And its body becomes dissolved, deconstructed by that which is in it. The same juices that was used to digest the food of a caterpillar when it was a lava now is breaking down its own body. I, I can't even wrap my mind around that. I, I can't even uh, figure out what that could possibly look like. That once the caterpillar wraps itself in the cocoon, it begins to melt by that which was in it. We are created to succeed. Caterpillars are born with everything they need to become a butterfly. There is no external help or assistance in this process. We de depend, even as believers, we depend too much on other people to be responsible for our transformation. Coming to church is not enough. When people say, I'm not being fed, are you feeding yourself? Coming to church and hearing good, good ministry of, of praise and worship and the preacher sweating and hawking and flipping and dancing across the floor is not going to change you. 
and, and, and folks depend on someone else to affirm them, to validate them, to promote them, to build them up, to worship them and admire them and build their self-esteem. But what you need to be successful, to survive and to thrive is inside of you. That which is already in the caterpillar is used to do away with the old that the new may come forth in purpose. See, God, we learned last week, also does not waste anything. He repurposes it. We talked about God not getting rid of darkness when he brought in light. But he had a purpose for darkness. Everything that God has allowed us to go through and even suffer, God can repurpose, will repurpose it, and use it for his glory. That's why it's important that we not walk in shame and guilt and embarrassment, but we defeat the enemy when we use our past to speak life into someone else's future. People need to know you are not the only one this has happened to. You're not the only one who is going through this. This is what I went through, and this is how I came out of it. It's called testimony. Testimony is not the new house, the new car, the more money, and all of that stuff. Testimony is God can change you. And I know he can heal. I know he can deliver. I know he can uh, 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 make you whole because that's what we need to be talking about. The old body of the caterpillar dies that the butterfly may come forth and fulfill his purpose. There, there is something in us that God wants to bring forth. But we have to be willing to go through the process of transformation. During the metamorphosis, the caterpillar is totally deconstructed as it turns into the butterfly. See, we have to get to a, a place where we are no longer recognizable. The caterpillar that goes into uh, that cocoon, you would never know that that butterfly was that caterpillar. Because transformation is complete in God. We want to hold on to who we are and say that we're filled with the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit changes. It changes our actions. It changes our attitude. And it changes our appetite. Amen. I, I know that a lot of this we, we heard last week, but I believe it's fresh today. Amen. It changes our appetite. See, when the, the, the caterpillar is eating, it, it eats a certain food. And the butterfly, if it is a species that feeds, it eats something different. This tells us that our appetites change when we change. We shouldn't see ministers and deacons up in the strip club. After the strip, strip club is closed, if they want to let you use their building to have church. But we shouldn't be there making it rain, talking about we're there to witness. Amen. If we've been delivered, our appetite has changed. 
if we've been delivered, we're not online scrolling through pornography. So I'll know who to pray for. Pray for you. If we've been delivered, we're not consuming things that harm our body. We had an amazing, amazing conference yesterday that talked about healing of our mental and emotional state, our spirit and our body, and how the body is linked, the things of the body that are not functioning properly, that our disease is linked to our spiritual state. So our appetites have to change. See, the enemy has all of, of this, this deception and lies out here that you're being judged and you're being shamed because you're not living according to God's word. And so folks on social media, here's what's not going to happen. You're not going to tell me how to do this. You're not going to tell me, praise the Lord. No. The trends of the world have nothing to do with God's truth. And his word and his expectation for us to live according to his word. It's in style now for folks to publicly exhibit their body parts. It's fashion. But it is not what God wants. God said be modest. You, you, you don't have to wear a burka, but we should not see your private parts in public. Bras are not outerwear. But that's the style now. And we've got to learn the difference. And it's not because the world is, is saying, you know, we accept this. It's all right. Why are you looking at me like that? Because I long for your soul. My heart aches to see people objectify themselves because that's what the world wants and that's what the world is paying for. Well, if the word is paying for me to do certain things, then, hey, I'm going to get this money. We have to stand and hold to the word of God. Our appetites must change. Our spirituality is connected to our sexuality. You can't separate them. Our appetites have to change, and, and that's how you can tell. That's how you can tell, Michelle, that, that you're, you're in process because the old saints used to say, when I was young, I'm an old saint now, the old saints when I was young used to say, the places I used to go, I don't go anymore. The things I used to do, I don't do anymore. They were saying, I've been changed. I've been transformed. I'm a new creature in Christ. I don't look the same. My friends recognize my physical body, but they don't recognize my spirit man. During the process of transformation, the caterpillar spins the cocoon and it serves during, uh, uh, as protection. It, it, it's, it serves to keep the caterpillar alive while it goes through its transformation. And as long as we remain in our comfort zones, that which is familiar, that which it, uh, uh, we, we know and, and are comfortable with, we will not be able to thrive and to fulfill our purpose. We have to welcome embrace and seek God for transformation. We have to seek him. It shouldn't be, if the Lord wants me to stop doing this, he, he should take it away. No, 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 no. No. So 
I, I wanted to go a little bit further quickly to answer the question, what do I do while I'm going through this struggle of my process? How do I survive it to get on the other side? What, 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 how do I manage being in that cocoon where I'm being totally reconstructed? Where I'm adopting a new lifestyle and things are changing around me and I'm losing friends and, 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 and don't have the familiarity and the comfort of that which is familiar. I, and I'm still dealing with my appetite. I'm still dealing with my struggle with the things that my flesh desires. Because Paul says, my flesh has nothing good in it. My flesh don't care about church, Bible study, or anything else. My flesh wants what it wants, when it wants it, how it wants it, and how much it wants it. How do I balance out this struggle that's in my flesh? My spirit wants to do good. When I come into the house of God and I hear his truth, I leave motivated. But then my flesh says, hey, they home. Why don't you stop over? Any, 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 anybody ever left church and, and did a drive-by? Y'all know what? My flesh says, I know it's not good for me. And that's, this is what took me into my bad health, but I just got to have another one. How do we deal with that when we're in the cocoon and we're being processed and we're hearing the word of God and it doesn't look like us? It's not reflected in our lives. We want it to be, but we're struggling. So I'm going to give you four things. Number one, consecration to be consecrated to be sanctified that means to be set apart you cannot stay in your old environment that is counter to the word of God and expect to make it as a newbie when you're not mature in Christ, you're still in the cocoon. You're still struggling. You're still trying to get to that other side. 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verses 14 through 18 says, and this is the New Living Translation. You be careful when you read the New Living Translation. It leaves parts of scripture out. So you have to compare that New Living Translation with another translation. Okay, be careful. So 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 18, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? The Bible says that we can't walk together except we be agreed. Now, we work with folks. We have family members. Amen. We, we have associates and, and, and all of that. But there's a different level of relationship with them once we become a believer. And that union can there, and what union can there be between God's temple, say I am the temple of God, and idols. For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, 
come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves. That is consecration. Don't touch their filthy things. One scripture tells us that we, we, we shouldn't even be wanting to hear and talk about and laugh and joke about what people are doing in sin. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. And I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So the first thing to help to alleviate your struggle during your process is you need to be around authentically holy God, spirit-filled people. That when you get weak, they won't be saying, girl, go ahead. The Lord knows your heart. But they will speak life into you and the word of God. And even say, why don't you come on over here and spend the weekend with me since, since you know, your flesh is acting crazy. Number two, fasting and prayer. I am not talking about, I'm a fast from TV. I'm a fast from social media. I'm going, no, food. Fasting from food. When we study the Bible, that's what fasting is talking about. Amen? And I'm, I'm going to, um, I don't know if it's going to be a series, but I'm, I'm going to do a teaching on fasting. Matthew 17, verses 19 through 21. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. How be it, this kind goes not out except by prayer and fasting. Fasting breaks the will of the flesh. Anything that you want to die, you just stop feeding it. It heightens the voice of God in your life. You cannot expect to live the way you were before you begin your uh, process of transformation and develop spiritually. You have to make up in your mind that you want God to reign in your life. The halfway thing is not going to work. It's not going to work. I tell people when they come to me for um, mentoring or um, advice or, or they will say counsel, but we don't, we're not certified as a counselor, so we don't say counselor. Amen? And ministers, you need to stop saying you're counseling people if you're not a licensed therapist because they can sue you. Biblical guidance. And I tell them when they come to me, you're all messed up in your head. I don't know what, I can't, what, I know. but when you make a decision and be willing to accept the consequences of your decision, be willing to walk through whatever happens because of your decision, then you have peace. Once you make up in your mind, you know what? I'm not doing this. You know what? I'm, 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 I'm tired of living like this. I'm going to do what I need to do. Yeah, people are going to drop off. You know how many people there are in the world? How many people are there in the world, Deacon Stratford? 
over two billion in the world. Okay. So one person drops off, and it's the end of your life? Come on, folks. Let's look at the big picture. Let's open your eyes. Some of us are walking through the world with eyes wide shut. Make a decision. For God I live, for God I die. Choose you this day who you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And when you make that decision and you walk in God's principles, your life will change. So you've got to separate yourself. You have to make a decision. I'm not going through this anymore. No, you can't come over here smelling like weed and wanting to roll me one. I love you, boo. Bye. You can't be afraid of change. And we've got to stop playing with God and do some real fasting. And fasting and praying because that that that. That the fast will heighten our connection with God. Now, along with the fasting, yeah, you need to stay off of social media, and yeah, you, you need to stay away from some things. See, we need to learn to practice silence and solitude. We're too busy trying to stay connected with everybody and be all up in their business and get involved in what they're doing and I got to help you out. No, no, you don't. You need to, to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Folks are grown. I tell my adult children, you will figure it out. And stop enabling Everybody in your life because you need to feel important and needed. You may have to talk to somebody that's certified as a therapist about your need to control everybody. That's not healthy. We tend to have a God complex as, as, as believers and feel as though we have to make everyone's life work. Let them put God on the throne of their heart and take you off. Your life will be so much easier. Okay? We're not talking about, you know, seeing your, your, your family sleeping in a, a cardboard box. I mean, you know, but y'all know what I'm saying. Just trying to solve everybody's problem. I need, I need $5. We'll go out there and Uber. I, 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 I need this. Well, go do this. I, I can't find a job. Where have you looked? Jobs don't knock on your door. Amen. Amen. Young people, when you apply for a job, they're going straight to find you on social media. So all that you're doing, you know, all that you're doing, I thought I had the job, but I didn't get it. They told me that they were going to send me the letter and everything. Yeah, but what does your social media look like? Feast on the word of God. Matthew 4, 1 through 4. Then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards hungry. And when the tempter, the enemy, came to him, he said, If you be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Now, we know God is omnipotent. Jesus is all-powerful. He could have done that. But Jesus answered the devil and said, It is written, Man shall not live by material things live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We live, we are sustained, we are washed, we are purged, we are purified by the word of God. You cannot, as a believer, be transformed and you have no prayer life except Lord help. Lord, give me, let me, can I have? 
And if you are not a student of the word, I'm not talking about reading Psalms 23 every night. A student of the word. There's a difference between reading and studying. There's a difference between browsing. Now let me read a couple of these verses, then let me flip, 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 let me read a No. As believers, it's the word of God that guides our life, that, that brings healing to our bones. It's the word of God that answers our questions and, and, and uh, gives us direction. We feast off of the word of God. And finally, somebody say, thank you, Lord. <laughs> we must recognize and resist the temptation of the enemy. You got to recognize Satan when he's standing in front of you, looking all dapper, looking all beautiful, talking all sweet, smelling all good. James the first chapter, verse 14, and then we're going to jump to the fourth chapter, verses 6 through 7. But every man, listen to this, every man or woman, when the Bible says man, it means mankind, unless he's speaking about a specific person, okay? To God, we are human, we are mankind, divided up into male and female, so that we can reproduce. God does not distinguish or discriminate between males and females. Amen. The female element is in God. Just like the male components and attributes are in God. Okay? Every man is tempted when he is drawn away, what does it say? Of his own lust. The enemy can only tempt us with that that we desire. Amen, Dick. He knows you better than you try to act like you don't know yourself. He knows what you like. He knows what you want. And, and we're not talking about physical all of the time. But he knows that you thrive off attention. He knows you thrive off of power. He knows you thrive off of status. He knows that you thrive off of pride. He knows that you thrive off of uh, accomplishing certain th things. He knows that you thrive when you feel like you're the, you're the queen or you're the king of the situation. He knows what motivates you. He knows your appetite. And that's what he brings to you. Yum, 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 yum. If you do this, then, I mean, come on now. What did he tell Jesus? If you bow down and worship me, I'll give you the word. How are you going to offer somebody what they created? But that's what he does to us. If you do this, then let me show you how that could end up. Could end up. How many of you know it never ends up that way? When you compromise yourself and you grab and reach for what the enemy's showing you, that thing goes left as soon as you get your hands on it. Every man is tempted and, and drawn away of his own lust and enticed. But he Verse four, uh, chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he says, God resists the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Pride 
is a lot of our problem. Pride is our pro problem. And pride doesn't always look like this. Pride goes to the store and buys things that it cannot afford. Pride will lie. All of social media is pride. People who make themselves look good, but that's not their everyday truth. Folks do it all of the time. Resumes. We know how to fluff and word and make ourselves sound as though we're, we're just the bee's knees. And that's not our reality. I know when I was in the workforce and coming up, you know, the uh, folks would talk about what technology that they were capable of doing because they thought they would never have to prove it. Then they get on the job, and, and, and it's a major project, and, and you're asked to do, put something in Excel or asked to do something on PowerPoint or whatever, and, and you, you don't have those skills, but your resume says you have those skills. That's pride. We resist the devil when we're fasting, we're praying, we're in God's word so we know his will and the do's and, and the don'ts. When we separate ourselves from the nonsense, I promise you that there is a large percent of preachers who are preaching TikTok songs. I, I have heard it. I'm like, okay, I know what, I know what that was. We have to purify ourselves. Whatever you feed yourself, whatever your diet is, everything isn't uh, bad on social media, don't get me wrong. It's a great tool, and it's fun, and it's a nice way to be in touch with folk, but the enemy puts his hand in everything. So when it gets to be too much, when we're talking to the wrong people too much, when you leave the house of God and the, you've had a mighty move of the spirit, but you still accept a call from the person who wanted to know, oh, what was that about? What, what, huh, yeah, yeah, that. Then you wonder why you've lost it. There are ways for us to love people but not be joined to them when our spiritual well-being is at stake. Because as long as we keep one hand holding on to the enemy and negativity, then there's no need for us to reach for God. Because at some point, you're going to be torn. And until you make the decision, I want to be transformed, I want to be changed, this is toxic, it's not healthy, it's not benefiting me. And you trust and believe God that if you submit to him totally, that he is going to make a way. Unbelief hold, keeps us with unbelievers. Unbelief keeps us with unbelievers. Well, if, if, if I don't hang with them, you know, every now and then they got an extra coin for me. The earth is the Lord's. God says, I love you. When we trust the love of God and stop expecting a person to say, I love you, how many of you know actions speak louder than words? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.